tonight we uh, are going to celebrate the uh, holiday of Tu B'Shvat. Tu B'Shvat comes from the uh, two letters Tet and Vav, which is uh, 9 and 6, which is 15. The 15th day of Shvat is designated as a holiday. The uh, Just to give you an idea, the uh, Ari in his uh, Priyets Chaim, which is a, um, a discussion from uh, Rabbi Chaim Vital on the secret of uh, Tu Ba'av and Tu B'Shvat, on the 15th day of Av and the 15th day of Shvat. Unfortunately, uh, for most of the world, the uh, Tu B'Shvat has uh, either no significance, and when I say most of the world, I'm referring to the uh, the Jewish world, and um, even those who pay some token of, uh, of, of recognition to this holiday will eat fruits on this particular day, new fruits. Why? Because it's called the new year for the fruits. And that's the extent of it. <coughs> Unfortunately, they uh, do not understand the significance of the uh, of this holiday and its deeper implication. And so that's what we are uh, going to discuss briefly uh, this evening. And always bearing in mind. <clears throat> that the only way we can make connections with any time zone, in other words, what is Tu Bishvat, a holiday? What is Rosh Hashanah in Tishrei, or what is Pesach? What are all the holidays? Well, traditional holidays. We know from a Kabbalistic point of view, those holidays mentioned in the Torah are merely to provide us with time zones, dates by which we can tap enormous energy. And if we do not have the knowledge of what these holidays are about, since knowledge is the connection, then we lack the connection. And therefore, we, we neglect our own well-being because what reason was there for the presentation of the Torah other than to provide us with, with additional strength that we can, to some degree, if not entirely, control our destiny. And so, as I mentioned many of the uh, publications, for us in Kabbalah, when one asks for everything, there is a road map. You want to take a trip from New York to California, and you've never done it before. Well, you'd ask, call up the AAA or somebody who can provide you with a road map. Because without a road map, how do you get from one place to the next? And what happens in between? Maybe there's something you'd like to see. Maybe there's something significant along the way. And we ask in Kabbalah, is there a road map for one to lead his destiny, for one to know how to move along in his life, I thought that's a journey as well. In fact, that probably is more of a difficult journey than any other kind of journey that we can uh, ever undertake. And do we have a road map? You know, what do we do now? What do we do today in our lives? It's a question of being lucky, or here we at least say that we do have a road map. There are signs along the road, along the road, that point out specific cosmic locations that if a particular month is uh, advantageous, we learn how to take advantage of it. If a particular month is to our disadvantage, we know how to take advantage of that as well, or at least not to be, not to become, un, not to become subject 
to their influenza. So we, according to the Kabbalah, we have roadmaps. We have a roadmap along this journey of our lives. And that roadmap is uh, Kabbalah. So getting back to Tu B'Shvat, just what is it? And usually we begin with the reading of the, uh, of the Yari or the Zohar. And uh, on uh, Tu B'Shvat, I usually begin with a reading of the Talmud. And more significant, significantly, today, more so than any other previous year in our lifetime, we may have done this going back maybe uh, 3,500 years ago uh, or 3,300 years ago when we were all in Babylonia. But in any event, the Talmud, as you, I assume, all know, was, uh, was uh, created incorporated into a compendium of, of uh, writings called the Talmud Bavli, which means the Talmud that began in Babylonia. The Talmud is also written in Aramaic, just like the Zohar. Just like the Zohar. And obviously, today, we are confronted with a situation in Iraq, which is Babel, and uh, it is not by chance that many significant things can occur today, tonight, and we're still looking for uh, solutions. We are not, we are not looking for uh, victims or survivors, or to be to be uh, victorious. Anyone looking for a victory in uh, in Iraq is making a mistake because victories in, in battle never accomplish the ultimate or never bring the ultimate solution. All we do, and we've been programmed like that, that when you have one war and you defeat the enemy, the world against the dictatorship or against evil, for whatever reason, for the past 2,000 years, all we've been doing is replacing one battlefield with another. One face of people with another. So obviously, for us here to go into and to be of a conscious mind that we are looking for the destruction of Saddam Hussein and uh, Iraq, and therefore we will have what? a temporary halt in bloodshed. Will that create a permanent solution? We are not even psyched into the idea that we can ever achieve a permanent solution. So whatever we are doing and what we have done the past Shabbat, we are going to take advantage <coughs> and try to bring about a solution. Because if there are 20,000, 50,000 casualties, that is no solution. Although we have been already programmed that uh, one must give up his life, one must give up his life for uh, liberty. And nobody here is to deny that liberty isn't our prime concern. However, we should also never forget that liberty without freedom a fear of, of the next war remains a question of, of what is liberty. In other words, we're buying time. We will enjoy here in the United States, we enjoy freedom. We have not been subjected to wars, but there are many families in this country that have been subjected to wars, and for them, whether the war took place in Germany or in, or in Japan, for them, the war took place here in the United States because if their loved ones do not return or if they return as, as, uh, as uh, wounded and uh, suffering uh, victims, then for them, the war came to the United States. What we are 
looking in this age of Aquarius, and we are in the month of Aquarius, and therefore we must put this into our consciousness, that we are no longer looking for the news that will tell us who's winning the battle. What we are looking for is solutions that should not always require bloodshed. Is that possible? The answer is yes, like I pointed out. There was freedom that was achieved in Europe without bloodshed, and therefore, if it was possible last year, it could also be possible. Not that it could be possible, it should be possible. And we must all, and all over the world, wherever we're celebrating Tu Bishvat Kabbalistically, we're psyching ourselves into that consciousness. Without that consciousness, and if all you're prepared for is the result of a, the destruction of Saddam Hussein, that's all we're looking for. That, that would be, uh, that would be uh, truly a misadventure. Because the removal of him by itself, and I'm not saying we're here to preserve Saddam Hussein. That's not the point I'm making. The point that I am making, that whatever the, whatever the outcome, whatever the outcome of this of this struggle in Iraq, the outcome should be a solution to the world's problem, and not just another stepping stone or breather to the next conflict. So, with that in mind, we will proceed now to the Talmud Bavli, and which tells us, Abba Rashi Shanim Hem. There are four Rosh Hashanah in the year. Four. One, which is more familiar to all of us, most people, Jew and non-Jew, is the Rosh Hashanah, which takes place in, uh, in Tishrei. The Rosh Hashanah, where supposedly the world, the entire world, the entire world, is being judged. The entire world is being judged. What does that mean for us? It doesn't mean only that God sits up there in judgment and uh, he's deciding who's going to live and who's not going to live. Does that mean he's going to put us to death or when it says, or he'll put us to life? What Rosh Hashanah means is not that God puts anyone to death. It's not the realm of God. That kind of comprehension of God was then we must consider God being evil without going into the, the, the whole philosophical uh, understanding that if God could meet out evil, he must have some, some substance there of evil. And of course it's not so. What Rosh Hashanah means to us, says the Zohar, on that day... The light, the light, the light, which is the source energy of man, plants, rock, trees, everything that exists in a material way in this world, receives its particular infusion of energy for one year and only one year only, as we've discussed on Rosh Hashanah. Therefore, there are four, because there are four kingdoms. There is the human kingdom, and therefore the Rosh Hashanah for us is on the first day of Tishrei. Then you have Rosh Hashanah of, of animals, of animals, which is in Elul. Elul, animals. Animals live from year to year for only one reason, because on Rosh Hashanah, they also, the light sees the purpose, the light, not God, sees the purpose of, of continuity, continuing this animal. So on, in Elu, this animal receives a, an infusion and it continues for the next year. If, whatever reason, that animal has served out its purpose, then it does not receive an injection for the coming year and therefore the animal will die by whatever means. Then we have Rosh Hashanah Limlachim, or Galim, and then we have Rosh Hashanah of uh, in the sun, in the first day of the sun, which establishes first of all when a king became a king, and also the holidays were established. In other words, 
this was the first month of the year. As you know, Rosh Hashanah in Tishrei or in September or in Libra is not Rosh Hashanah of, of the holidays. The Rosh Hashanah of the holidays in the first holiday is Pesach, the month of Pesach. Then there is one more Rosh Hashanah, one more Rosh Hashanah, and that is, and that is Le'ilan, for the trees, for the trees. And there is a disagreement when this Rosh Hashanah for the trees takes place. Rosh Hashanah Le'ilan Kedivri Bet Shemai Bet Shemai considers the first day of Shvat this month this month of Shvat considers the first day of Shvat Rosh Hashanah for trees Bet Hilal Omrim not the first day of Shvat, but the 15th day of Shvat. Tu B'Shvat. Now obviously, we, we all follow the, the, the decision of uh, Hillel, the decision of Hillel, that on the 15th day of Shvat is, uh, is when Rosh Hashanah takes place. So we have the Talmud Bavli discussing this matter and presenting us with a disagreement between Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel. And we follow the tradition of Hillel. Now what, what is the discussion? What is the discussion? I mean, on Rosh Hashanah, there's also, a, we, we have learned also a disagreement. But we follow the tradition, Rosh Hashanah is in Tishrei, in the month of Libra. But here, there is a discussion within the same month, and one says the first day of the month, one says the 15th day of the month. And as we have already learned, the other di uh, dictum of, uh, of Talmud Bavli, that Elu ve'elu divra le'kim chayim, which means... Both Shammai and both Hillel are both correct. Now, obviously, how can they both be correct when one says the first day and one says the 15th day? But that is a dictum in Talmud that both are correct. Now, it is also a dictum in Zohar. In Zohar, they're both correct. But there's, there are opposite opinions or different opinions and the answer is and this of course we have discussed on many occasions the Zohar provides us with that, uh, the answer as to how both can be correct it depends it depends from what perspective these people originate that's only if you believe that man is not a, of a robotic consciousness as scientists would like us to believe that means, do we control the, the, the movement of, of the stars, which are billions of miles away? How could we control the stars? So they say we don't. They say we can't control anything in this universe. They even <coughs> have convinced us that we cannot add as quickly or multiply as quickly as a little computer. But the Talmud and the Zohar are not of that opinion. They believe, they both believe that man, man with his consciousness, man with his consciousness controls the entire world because the whole world is only consciousness and I won't go into that. Uh, it'll appear in, uh, in a book soon, what that means. But in other words, everything that's of a physical material, uh, physical material nature is uh, is an illusion, is an illusion. But the Zohar explains that why Bet Shammai says the first day of Shvat, first day, 
He says very, very, very simply, because Bet Shammai, the, the, uh, the composite of the internal characteristic of Bet Shammai was Givura Din, judgment. Whereas the people or the school of Hillel were of Chesed, sharing. Not Givura, Givura is judgment, Din, harshness. Whereas the people of the school of Hillel were those of sharing. We have the same discussion concerning uh, the uh, lighting of the candles. Beit Shammai said we start with eight and go down to one. Hillel says we start with one, we go up to eight. It's the same idea. Because the reason that they have their opinions is not because their brain dictated well, I think I'm smarter than you and I figured it out and this is what it should be. You know, like in a discussion between two people. That's why in Kabbalah we say two people who may have opposite views of the same thing are both right. Therefore, what's the point in, 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 in uh, arguing? Yes, there can be a discussion because each one presents his view but coming from another perspective. So they're both right. They're both right. So... But Shammai said the first day in Shvat, the Hebrew month of Shvat, which is the month of Aquarius, is because with him everything is uh, din, harshness. Now on the first day of the month, while we know it's a powerful day, it's Rosh Chodesh, but nevertheless, <coughs> if we look upon the moon, which directly affects us, you know, it, it, it affects uh, the moon affects many things, high tide, low tide, and, and, and a multitude of many of other things. The moon does have an, a direct influence over human behavior. It does. It does. I mean, scientifically, it does. Since the moon has barely made its appearance on the first day, maybe a speck of the moon, with a telescope, you can only see it with a telescope, otherwise it... It, it appears to be uh, non-existent. Meaning, the lack of light. It's just like Bet Shammai said, we start with eight and we go down to one. That's a pessimistic attitude. But it's a harsh attitude. It means this world is based on harsh realities. In other words, the lights are always going out. That's why Bet Shammai said you start with eight and wind up with one. In other words, this world deals with judgment. This world deals with a lack of light. And just like Bet Shammai said, you go from eight to one on Hanukkah, the same way as he says, when is Rosh Hashanah? It would be at the time of Gevuda of the month, when there is no light. The same way as when the light goes up from eight to one on Hanukkah. Rosh Hashanah, a Rosh Chodesh, has almost no light. Therefore, that is the day that he declared to be the new year for trees. Bet Hillel, always assuming that there is growth or revelation or an increase of light. That's why he goes from one to eight. Therefore, he decided that the cosmic time zone for Tu B'Shvat would be when there would be the greatest amount of light. When, what, what day of the month would that be? On the 15th. Because on the 16th, there is already a descending moon. On the 14th day, there is an ascending moon, but not complete. And therefore, Hillel, always with this consciousness of what the world is all about, some say he was therefore the optimist, but that's, that's not what we're talking about. He was saying that this light is complete, this world is complete with light, complete with light, and therefore things that occur, occur with light, rather than the absence of light. Hillel on the other point, on the other side, would consider this world, if, in, in its observation, eye observation, as a world of chaos, destruction. All you see around us, sick people, wars, marital problems, business pro failures, all you see is problems. And therefore, coming from that perspective, he said, then you choose the day where there's almost no light. And so he said, 
the first day of Shvat. He knew it had to be in Shvat. And therefore, along comes Hillel and says, no. Failure, chaos, disorder is an illusion. And what actually does exist is light. And therefore, he considered the infusion by the light of Rosh Hashanah, meaning since Rosh Hashanah is that day that infuses light rather than like Shammai says it infuses negativity, he says no. This world is full of positivity. And therefore, Shvat, Shvat, this month. And why is this month? We discussed it partially because this month is Aquarius. So what if it's Aquarius? I mean, why, why must the Rosh Hashanah of trees be this month? Why not another month? On the 15th day. And have your same disagreement between Shammai and Hillel. And we said because they're both, they both agree that it must be in the month of, uh, of Shvat, in the month of Aquarius. There was no discussion about that. <coughs> Why was there no discussion about which month it should take place? Because the age of Aquarius, the age of Aquarius is Mashiach. How do we know it's Mashiach? You know how we know it's Mashiach? Because it's the Rosh Hashanah of trees. In other words, the Rosh Hashanah of trees is directly linked to Mashiach. How do you figure that one out? The answer is, as we discussed it uh, last week uh, in our discussion of uh, of uh, Shvat, what is Mashiach? What is Mashiach? It means when the world collectively or individually achieves a restriction kind of consciousness. In other words, rather than everyone for himself, it becomes a collective community of what? Of restriction. As we know in the bulb, the filament turns the light on, not the switch. Not the switch. Because you could have a switch, put on the switch, and if the filament doesn't work, you've got nothing, even though you've got a charge of electricity coming into that bulb. The filament is what puts the light on. The filament. Therefore, this month, this month, is called the month of light, and that is the month of Mashiach. Now, how do we equate trees with Mashiach? And so we discussed last week that what is an, an Elon? First, we take the physical aspect of the tree. Then we'll come to its metaphysical implication. The physical aspect of trees are that they grow against the force of gravity. They overcome limitation. It overcomes limitation. It overcomes limitation. What does it mean it overcomes limitation? In other words, the force of gravity, everything is being pulled. We can't, why can't we fly in, in, in midair? Why can't we fly? Soon we will. The time will come soon that we will be able to resort just to flying like the astronaut in another realm, which we call the Zedan Pin realm. They can, they can walk and they fly, but they don't even have to fly. They just walk. And can, and can cover and can uh, traverse this entire 25,000 circumference of the earth, 25,000 miles in one hour. In one hour. And he doesn't even run. He's just walking. Just walking. So the problem in this world is what we call the desire to receive for the self alone, which is indicated by the... Uh, by the uh, trees, eh, I'm sorry, by, by earth, by its pull to itself. Trees operate, trees operate contrary, contrary, contrary to the force of gravity. And therefore, what, the, what is the purpose of the filament? What is the purpose of the filament in, uh, in, uh, 
in a bulb. It is to restrict, restrain the force of the minus pole in the bulb, the minus pole, pole in the bulb, from drawing in the electrical current. It pushes it back. That's what a tree is. That's what a tree is. Now also, that's, that is the physical significance of trees. And therefore, trees represent, trees represent Mashiach. So if we ask, why is, or why have astrologers and why has Kabbalistic astrology or the Zohar designated the uh, month of Shvat, this Hebrew month of Shvat as the month of Aquarius? Not because that's the name, as it is in conventional astrology, but on the contrary. The reason it's called the month of Shvat is because it is the month of Rosh Hashanah to the, for the trees. Because it is the month of Rosh Hashanah for the trees. In other words, what's the cause and what's the effect? Now if we also use the, the, use the uh, benefits of numerology, we will find that Elon, Elon is 91. And the minute you hear the word 91, it gives you like, like a physicist, right? E equals MC squared. I mean, what is that? A letter with a little number? I mean, what is it? But it tells the whole story. We have something like that called numerology in, in Kabbalah. What's the purpose of it? Not just to make some nice combinations of letters. But when, when there is a word like Elan and it takes on some very, uh, some significance, it tells us that Elan, which is 91, is the, is the connection is the unifying of Adne, Alev Dalad Nun Yud, which is one of the names of God, and the Tetragrammaton, which is 26. Adne is 65. When you have the physical and the metaphysical, when you have the spiritual and the material, both as one unified whole, you have Mashiach. So while we may not have a collective Mashiach, we can have our own particular individual Mashiach. And therefore, it is significant that it's on the 15th day, obviously, because on the 15th day says the Zohar. What is significant about the 15th day? I mean, how come the moon is completely lit up? So you say, well, naturally, because then the moon faces the complete moon faces the sun without any obstruction by the earth. So would an astronomer explain away what is happening. But in Kabbalah, we are not satisfied with what is happening. We want to know why is it happening. And that's where the astronomer or the physicist gets lost. He puts up his hands and says, I can't answer that kind of a question. In fact, if you read uh, books on physics, they will tell you. Physics deals with the nature of things, not the why of things. The nature of things. Not why they came about that way, but what they are. So they think they even have achieved that, which they haven't. They achieved, of course, as you know, the uncertainty principle, that even what is in a physical level, they say is uncertain. So are they going to get now into the idea of why these things came about? So we say that the two forces or the two worlds that we live in, Zeran Pin as it's called, the Eitzah Hayim level, or the Eitzah Dat level, which is our material world, when they are joined as one unified whole, you have Mashiach. This is what we, what we strive for when we say we're looking forward to a collective Mashiach, Mashiach for the whole world. What are we talking about? We're discussing when the material will be totally governed by the metaphysical 
or by the spiritual. What is the spiritual? What is the spiritual? Sharing. What is light? Sharing. What is this world? Desire to receive. Receiving. But this world is called the tree of knowledge because it has two characteristics in the desire to receive. There is a desire to receive which is called for the, for the self alone and there is another desire to receive for the sake of sharing. Through the art of, of the desire to receive for the sake of sharing, we then can achieve some communion with the tree of life. So the tree, the tree, and on the 15th day, the reason why the sun has no, can shine completely on the moon and there is no obstruction and the, and the earth cannot be in position to create a descending or an ascending moon on the 15th is because there is a cosmic effect of unity on the 15th day. And so Tu Bishvat takes on an added feature, an added feature, more specifically this month, because in every month we have the 15th day of the month. And we know that we have another very significant day just opposite to Shvat, which is Av. They are in, they're on opposite uh, polarities. You have Av, which is Leo, and the 15th day, as you know, is, is called a holiday, a very significant, powerful holiday. But it's not, the, it's not the holiday of Mashiach. On this 15th day, it is the 15th day where uni, uni, unity exists. And that it is, if we have that opportunity, if we have knowledge, which you are acquiring at this moment, when you have that knowledge, we then, we then, and only then, we must remember that, only then can we then begin to control the events before they take place in this world. Because who wants to take place, who wants to get involved after the fact and then beginning to, to cut away the, the, um, the, the, uh, the misfortune or, 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 or the, uh, the activity that uh, is uh, revolting or repulsive or whatever. If we can connect into the area, into that realm, before the physical manifestation, there, whatever accomplishments we can achieve will necessarily affect the movie as, we, as it appears here. So Shvat, being a very powerful month, the month of Mashiach, finds a Tu Bishvat, Tetvav, Tu Bishvat. Now this year is more significant than any, than any year I understand, I, I'm not sure, but uh, I was told by Benjamin, what's happening, this Tu Bishvat, happens only once in 400 years. What is happening? An eclipse. An eclipse. What does the Zohar have to say about an eclipse? It, it is so, and, and Baruch Hashem, you know, I, I have... Uh, been devoting the past uh, two weeks, the past two weeks to the idea that we hopefully, well, I should use the word hopefully, then you know, you're leaving it up to chance, but that we can accomplish with the, with the participation of everyone in all of the different activities that are directed specifically to um, to the idea of controlling the physical manifestation of chaos. And if there is now uh, an impending chaos in uh, Iraq, for us right now, there's, there's a situation that we know that we can control if we can only touch the metaphysical realm and then direct, and then direct the movie, as it will subsequently be played out on the physical realm. 
there is an eclipse. Now, what what is what what does an eclipse mean? How would I know? How does anyone know what an eclipse means? Who wants to know what an eclipse is? You ask an astronomer. All he's doing tonight is getting his batteries of telescopes together to take a look. And then what will that do for you and I? What has all the rocks that they've that they've retrieved from the moon done for you and I? What has anything that has to do with astronomy done for you and I, or for the world? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And if the Big Bang is this way, if the Big Bang is that way, and it's two seconds after the Big Bang, one second after the all this accumulation of data, the billions that are spent each year, how has it helped in any minute way to enhance our living, to enhance the lifestyles of, of, of all peoples of the world? So what is eclipse? We have a zoa. How else would we know? He wants to tell us what is the significance of an eclipse? This is a Zohar in uh, this is a Zohar in uh, in Kitetse. in uh, Daf uh, Mendalet Mendalet forty four. Because the the moon is inclusive of Tovera, the H Adat concept of good and evil, the the metaphysical activity. When I say metaphysical, I'm talking about something that's you know somewhere we don't know where. We're talking about consciousness. We're talking about a power of consciousness. We are talking about an influence of consciousness that directs our lives, as we know the moon does. The moon significantly does things uh, to, this, to, the, to the environment of Earth, and we feel, we feel its influence. Now, of course, there's no direct linkage between the moon and Earth, no direct linkage, but we know that we are affected by the influences of, uh, of the moon. And the Zohar says that the moon is inclusive of tovera, of good and evil. Mechashvim ba Yisrael u mechashvim ba b'nei Yishmael. The Jew is affected and Yishmael is affected. Yishmael. And I don't want to go into uh, the discussion that we have discussed many a time, who's a Jew and who's Yishmael. None of us will ever know, as the Talmud says, until Elijah the prophet comes, because Jew is a concept with certain stipulations, but the stipulation of what constitutes a Jew is that if he is born from a Jewish mother, yeah, then he's Jewish, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he is Jewish. Only Elijah will come around and tell us who is Jewish and who is not. Now, what does it mean, Jew? Those people, those people, those people who were created for the purpose of correcting something in this world, making a correction, making an additional impact towards positive activity in this world. Then there are negative people in this world. They are labeled Yishmael. Does that mean that every one who is from the... From the uh, uh, family of Yishmael is uh, negative? No. No. But they have a certain function here too. And so they are called they are called Yishmael. These labels are merely to indicate to us not what we understand today as who is Jewish and who is not, but rather concepts of consciousness. 
A Jew consciousness means one thing. The highest intensity of desire to receive for the self alone. It's the highest. Strongest. That's the concept of Jew. That's the concept of Jew. And when he was born, and when he was born as a Jew, as a Jew, it was to provide him again with a merging of the physical level of the highest intensity of the desire to receive together with the consciousness of the highest level of, of desire to receive. Okay, I, I, just in passing I mentioned that. When the moon is eclipsed in the time that it is ascending, ascending, which is the time of Chesed, and we discussed that. Chesed is when the lights go up, when there's sharing going on. We know the first 15 days of the month is a good, is a good section within that month, a good, is positive at that time because the moon, when it is ascending to us, only indicates for us is a time zone. We have signposts along the road. You remember we discussed at the very beginning. Signposts. When should I start a new venture? When should I get married? Or when should someone go in if he's got to go in for an operation? When? Who tells you when? Who tells you when? Besides some doctor who wants to play golf tomorrow, so he says, I only have today. Who tells you when? In business, you have someone who tells you when. In life, who tells you when? Therefore, when the sun, when the moon is ascending, which is called bimei lua, in the time when it's becoming fulfilled, and then there is eclipse, simerali Israel. It's a bad sign. That means, what does it mean, a bad sign? means that this month, this month, <coughs> when that eclipse takes place, let's say any month, but on the eighth day of the month, the ninth day of the month, then negative activity of the moon is directed and has been directed and is channeled by the force that runs the operation because that is that is the time zone for the moon's negative influence it will be directed towards Israel towards Israel but when it is eclipsed in the days of her chisaron uh, the days of descending simen ra it's an evil sign for then for Ishmael. But that with this is the Zohar never gets into politics, and, and certainly we are not here to get into politics. We are here for what purpose? To provide solutions to the world. Kabbalah says it is the solution, it is the only solution to use the words of Moshe Rabbeinu, if we trust them. The only solution. Not a solution. The only solution. That because this world must contain good and bad, good and evil, because otherwise there would be no, the, the idea of removal of bread of shame would never, would never come about. When the eclipse takes place, before or after, it is an energy that is a negative energy. Eclipse is negative energy. Why is it negative energy? Says the Zohar. 
because the moon is being beaten. What do you mean it's being beaten? <coughs> Whereas it should have received an infusion of total positivity from the sun, it's being thwarted. It's being directed or channeled elsewhere, not to the moon. Because there's no disappearance in energy. So that energy, in place of, 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 uh, of being channeled through the moon, now being channeled elsewhere. That's called an eclipse. So an eclipse, by and within itself, indicates to us it's not evil. Neither, neither is the moon evil. Neither is, is, is the, the, uh, the fact that Earth now is standing between the moon and, and, uh, and the sun, the position. But if that, if that eclipse takes place in the early part or the first 15 days, it is positive channeling for those people called Jews or those people who are righteous, those people who are righteous, those who are evil, whatever that means, and I don't want to go into it what it means because we are not here to decide we are the righteous and he's the culprit as it is usually the nature of people and therefore that has never provided any solutions what we are looking for what we are looking for that if enough positive energy is generated in this universe then who are we talk what's the difference who is good or who is evil if there's enough positive energy generated in this universe, then even those, whoever they are, wherever they are, no matter how evil they are, evil is darkness. If you can put on enough light, you don't have to bang out the, the negativity. You don't have to bang out darkness. It just walks away by itself. It disappears. And so for two weeks now, going on two weeks now, tonight, to the night, a little more than that, we have been engaged, all the centers all over the world, have been engaged in bringing about a solution. A solution that doesn't spell out victor, conquest, or vanquished. How it results is not even our business. If the light can, if a light can only become manifest, and let's assume Saddam is that evil person that he is, and let's assume the Iraqi, whoever, they should disappear. Disappear. You know what disappear means? There's no disappearance in this world, except for one feature. Except for one feature. That which is darkness. You light a match in a dark room, the darkness disappears. You don't say its energy has filtered down to another area. It's disappeared. That's what we're here for tonight. Now, this eclipse takes place not before the 15th and not after the 15th. It's taking place on the 15th. Now, which is it? So, if you only wait for information, if you wait for information, it'll come. But if you've got too much of your brain power working for you over time, the chances are it will never come. But if you wait, ask the light, give me some information. And so I was told again another piece of information by Binyamin that the eclipse will take place in Israel because that is the center of where energy originates. If I know correctly, at the dawn, uh, at the day, at daybreak, is that correct? At daybreak, eight o'clock. That means in Israel there is no eclipse. You know why there's no eclipse? Because it's daytime. When do you see the eclipse? In Israel, they will not see an eclipse. So naturally, 
everyone will be running around to other parts of the world where it's dark. Because how can you see an eclipse if it's not nighttime? The only time you can see an eclipse is nighttime. We should all be running to... What's that? No, only at night. You look at the, you look at the moon, and you know you're accustomed to seeing the moon whatever position, all of a sudden it's blacked out. Maybe for a few minutes. The sun happens to be in that position with the earth where normally it shouldn't be. And all of a sudden, there's an eclipse. And we will, you, don't, you will not see it tomorrow in Israel. So it's the earth that is blocking. What's that? Earth. earth is blocking, yes. But that this should happen on the 15th day. On the 15th day. happens from what I have to been told, and I can understand it doesn't happen often, certainly doesn't happen often. Even the Zohar did not even discuss an eclipse on the 15th day. It discussed an eclipse before the fifth, be, uh, in its ascension or descending. What a powerful day. Why is it so powerful? It means, it means that there is a possibility that what should have been negative in a way, either for one or the other, suddenly we have a situation where it's not going to be, it's not going to be negative either for Yishmael, and it will not be negative for for Yisrael. What we've been talking for the past four months, the solution is not bloodshed or conquest. The solution is that the problem disappears. But we never believe. We've always been told the problem will not doesn't disappear. And you know what? A problem does not disappear. However, can we make it disappear? If we are provided with tools, and that's what we're doing tonight. We are being provided with tools. The study session is the tool. Why is it the tool? Because we've made a connection with this entire being called Tu Bishvat, the 15th day of this month. With all of its implications, we have made a connection. When you make a connection, and the only way you can make connections is by and through knowledge, and we have done that now, we have made that connection, we have made that connection, therefore we will, during the Suda that we we'll have the short suda, which is to bring whatever light that we have been connecting with by virtue of information with a consciousness that we want to control the activity where, it's, where it takes place. It does not take place here. Remember, according to the Zohar, what takes place in this world is already the movie that has already been played. In other words, if we were to observe a, a World War II movie today, would you say, and, and it's been taken, you know, live, would you say today there's, there's World War II going on? Of course not. But it's real. It was taken at the action, but it's only, it's only a run of what once took place. When a war takes place in this world, or misfortune takes place in this world, it originated in the world of metaphysics, just like no action comes about from us, no personal activity, provided it had prior thought. Everything first originates in that metaphysical realm. Therefore, we will, we will, we will be uh, joining as one unified whole with all of this information, and directing the moon which is our channel for the force and on this 15th day when they are completely unified Zerampin or the moon and the sun are unified Zerampin which is the sun code name for the metaphysical realm the realm of Eitzach Hayim and Malchut which is the realm of the physical illusionary reality that they both be joined and so there never be a desire to receive for the self alone and therefore when I said we'll be able to fly if we can 
if we can contain and and master the desire to receive for the self alone, what we are in effect doing is is almost eliminating gravity. What happens if there's no gravitational forces? That we have the same situation as the astronaut has up in outer space. Same situation. It is not far fetched. It's it's logical thinking. If there can be a control over the forces of gravity, which is only a, a which is only a mirror image of the desire to receive for the for the self alone. So this will be this is our thinking, and this is where we want this valuable day today. That hopefully, I use that word hopefully. You see, I can't even get rid of that. Uh, preset program in my youth and part of my adulthood can't get away from it but that we will direct the solution to that war and all shall see that it is possible and that in the future will be our our posts our posts it's as we have serious situations both in our own personal lives or collectively, that we can tap energies, take advantage of situations as we are tonight, and with that, bring, if not the eternal Mashiach, at least a Mashiach for a period in time. Amen. Amen.